Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome back. Recently, Blackpin Redpin made a couple of videos comparing the cardinalities of certain sets. He asked, which has more elements, the natural numbers or the integers? And when we ask which has more elements, we're really asking which set has the greater cardinality. Now, cardinality is literally how many elements when it comes to finite sets, but for infinite sets, I wouldn't take it too literally. It's more of an extension of that idea. Now, some of the results he got are seemingly unintuitive to some people. For example, he concluded that the natural numbers and the integers have the same number of elements because they do. They have the same cardinality. But people say, wait a minute, the natural numbers is a subset of the integers. So how could it be that the integers and the natural numbers have the same amount of elements? Well, the issue is there are multiple ways to compare the sizes of sets and all of these different ways of comparing the sizes of sets have their place. The three I want to talk about today are cardinality, set containment, and the Lebesgue measure. The Lebesgue measure is specifically about the real numbers or any n-dimensional real space. But in this video, we're just going to talk about the real number case. The Lebesgue measure can be thought of as the total length that the set occupies on the real number line. So we're going to cover all three of these and compare the same sets that Blackpin Redpin did with these other notions of sizes of sets. So first, let's remind ourselves what cardinality is. If we have two sets, A and B, and there exists an injective function from A to B, then the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B. In other words, if this function F exists and it's an injection, then A is smaller than B in the sense of cardinality. And set containment. If A is a subset of B, then in a certain sense, A is smaller than B. It lies completely inside of B. So we have two notions of size, cardinality and set containment, and they mean two different things. Sometimes one of them is appropriate, sometimes the other is appropriate. And finally, Lebesgue measure. I hope I'm spelling this right. So we're going to define this more rigorously in a second. So for now, I'll just say the length of a set of real numbers. Sick. Okay. Now, let's get to the definition of Lebesgue measure because I realize that that isn't as common as the other two. Now, Lebesgue measure is pretty important. You, you would see this in analysis a lot. So let me give you an example of where the Lebesgue measure is meaningful. Let's say we have a function f and we integrate this function from a to b. And let's say we have some set x that lies inside the closed interval from a to b. In other words, we integrate over x along this, this integral. Now x doesn't need to be an interval itself, it can be any subset of a to b, it can be anything. Well, the Lebesgue measure of x, or I'll just call it L of x throughout this video, because I really like that fancy L, it's probably my favorite symbol. That's gonna determine how much the set x contributes to that integral. That should make sense. An integral can be thought of as area, and we're integrating along the x-axis. However much total length the set x occupies on the x-axis is going to contribute more to the total area given by the integral. So this is a very common and important notion of size when it comes to calculus and analysis and things like that. All right, so let's define the Lebesgue measure. Now, technically, I'll be defining what's called the Lebesgue outer measure in this video. The distinction is not something worth getting into right now. So here's the what we're calling Lebesgue measure. Man, I really hope I'm spelling this right. Okay, <clears throat> now let's look at an open interval A to B. Now it's pretty simple what the Lebesgue measure of this interval will be. We want the Lebesgue measure to be a notion of length. So the Lebesgue measure of this interval is B minus A. Exactly what you would expect. That's the length of this interval. Now we want to extend this idea to 
general subsets of the real numbers. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this basic case to sort of build this measurement. So let's let x be an arbitrary subset of the real numbers. Now we're going to define the Lebesgue measure on a general subset of the real numbers. So we're going to begin with a little mini definition. Let's say we have a family of open intervals. We'll just call these open intervals i sub n. We'll index them by the natural numbers. So let me write that. So I have this family of open intervals that I'm calling i sub 1, i sub 2, i sub 3, and so on. Now let's say that x is contained in this union of open intervals. Now, <clears throat> when this happens, we will say that this family of open intervals covers x. So given a countable family of open intervals, if x is a subset of the union of all of those intervals, we will say that that family covers x. Now we're covering x by these open intervals because we know how to take the little bag measure of an open interval. So we're going to use this to get the little bag measure of x. Now, here's what we're going to do. For these intervals i sub n, we're going to take their little bag measure. Man, that is such a gorgeous L. So we'll take the little bag measure of an interval and we're going to sum all of these from n equals 1 to infinity. So we're summing the lengths of all of these intervals. Now we aren't done yet because all we know about this family is that it covers x. All we know is that x is contained in the union of all of these intervals. It could be that x is much smaller than this union of intervals and so the sum of the lengths of these intervals would actually be much too large to describe the Lebesgue measure of x. So how are we going to fix that? Well, Instead of just one random covering to look at, let's look at all of them. So we're going to say the set of all of these sums of lengths of intervals such that the family i sub n for n n n covers x. And I'm going to take the infimum of that set. And that is the Lebesgue measure of x. So let's recap that a bit. So we have this set x. It's covered by families of open intervals. Given some family of open intervals that covers x, sum up the lengths of all of the intervals in that family. Now consider the set of measurements you get when you do that for every covering of x and take the infimum of that set. I mentioned that this covering may be much larger than the set x. So we'll look at all of the covers, add up all those lengths, and take the infimum to close in on x. So that is our definition of the Lebesgue measure of an arbitrary subset of the real numbers. All right, first let's see how the naturals compare to the integers. All right, well, we know that cardinality-wise, they are the same. Black pen, red pen showed us that we can put a bijection from n to z or z to n, and that shows that they have the same cardinality. Now, what about set containment? Well, this is an easy one. Z contains n, so set containment-wise, z is the bigger set. All right, now let's think about Lebesgue measure. We need to take the Lebesgue measure of the integers and the natural numbers. So first, let's try to find the Lebesgue measure of the natural numbers. Remember that the Lebesgue measure is basically how much total length the set takes up on the real line. And while the integers are a set of kind of isolated points, there are infinitely many of them, but they're still isolated points. So you might think, well, the Lebesgue measure of the natural numbers must be zero. It occupies a zero total length on the real number line. And you would be correct. The Lebesgue measure of the natural numbers is zero. So let's attempt to prove that. Now for any epsilon greater than zero, 
we can put a certain interval around n. Let's choose this one. So n is at the center of this interval, it lies inside of it. Now let's call this i sub n. And let's take the family of all of these intervals indexed over the natural numbers. And that gives us a cover of the natural numbers. Every natural number is in one of these intervals. Uh, for example, 42 is in i sub 42. So basically, around each natural number, we're putting an interval. So of course, all of these intervals cover the natural numbers. So given this cover, let's sum up all the lengths of these intervals. Now the length of one of these intervals is this stuff minus this stuff, so that gives us 2 epsilon over 2 to the n. And 1 over 2 to the n, summed from 1 to infinity, is 1, so in total this is 2 epsilon. Now since all of these are covers, when we take the Lebesgue measure of n, It considers all of the covers of the natural numbers, including the ones of this form that we've constructed. And we have a sum of lengths of two epsilon, and this is a cover for any epsilon greater than zero. So when we take the infimum, considering the ones that we've constructed, which can be made to be arbitrarily small in total summed up lengths, we get that the infimum is zero. And so the Lebesgue measure of the natural numbers is zero. All right, now let's take the Lebesgue measure of the integers. Well, the argument's gonna be pretty similar. So let's let x be an integer. Now for any epsilon greater than zero, we have that same interval covering x. Okay, and now we have the cover formed by all of these intervals. Now to finish this off, we're going to use the fact that the natural numbers and the integers have the same cardinality. Let's let f from z to n be a bijection. And then we can define the intervals i prime sub f of x to be a family of intervals indexed by the naturals that cover the integers. And then we have this family. And then from there the argument is going to be exactly the same. So we can conclude that the Lebesgue measure of z is also zero. There's nothing special about the integers in this argument. As long as we can form a bijection from the set to the natural numbers, we have that it's going to have measure zero. So we can conclude that every countable set has measure zero. However, the converse of that statement is not true. Although every countable set has a measure zero, there are also uncountable sets that have a measure zero. The go-to example of this is the Cantor set, which is uncountable with a measure of zero. All right, so in conclusion, Cardinality-wise, n and z are the same size. Set containment-wise, n is smaller than z. And in the sense of Lebesgue measure, they are the same size. They are also the same size as any countable set and any finite set. So in the next video, we'll be comparing the other two pairs of sets we have remaining. But for now, that's going to do it, and I'll see you guys in the next video.